There is a lot to talk about. Let's get to our panel with us here in the studio. Saurabh Gupta is a resident senior fellow at the Institute for China America Studies. Also with us, Anthony Nelson is the director of the East Asia and Pacific Practice at the Albright Stonebridge Group. From Beijing, Xiao Hai is an assistant research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And from Singapore, where the summit just wrapped up, we welcome via Skype Amitendu Palit. He is a senior research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Let's start in Singapore with Amitendu. And Amitendu, uh, of course, Asia-Pacific region facing a number of challenges right now. Uh, how to expand trade, a growing middle class, uh, cyber issues, the movement to digital industries, digital jobs, climate change. So what do you think this summit achieved? I think uh, in terms of distinct achievements, uh, one of the important points to be noted is that, uh, like ASEAN usually strives to do on most occasions, it tries to ensure that progress is maintained and the rate of progress is often slow, not always uh, as expected. It's often painstakingly slow, perhaps almost just a step at a time or a year. But I think ASEAN on the whole, through all the bilateral talks that have taken place during this summit, as well as the uh, collective uh, meetings that have taken place either on the RCEP or uh, the ASEAN plus three, have tried to take forward the fact that there is a strong degree of agreement among the members, at least within the ASEAN group and among most of its partners, on the fact that the movement uh, on, on, on a stable regional architecture needs to be maintained. I would rate that as the biggest achievement, even though I must admit that there's actually not much for the meeting to show in terms of very concrete outcomes. I think the closest that I can come to specifying a concrete outcome is what has been uh, noted with respect to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, where it's mentioned that uh, substantive progress has been achieved in the countries as a bag of 16 very different heterogeneous countries fighting their own domestic challenges agree to hold on to the RCEP and reach conclusion by next year. So I would rate this as a major achievement, apart from the fact that, you know, uh, with, with such a very diverse group, there were always issues that the ASEAN-centric efforts could fall apart. Countries could uh, veer off in various directions and just take a position that, look, we are, we are not willing to play ball. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is on one side of the game. The Asia-Pacific is on another side of the game. Some part of it is overlapping, some part of it is not. But I think all those tensions in a fairly substantive fashion, clouding the context of the meeting did not eventually get to spillover in the meeting. So I would say that order was maintained, progress was maintained, and some signs of fruitful conclusions in the near future were visible. So Rob, as we heard there, a strong degree of agreement at the ASEAN summit, but also, as Amitendra points out, a lot of issues, some of the challenges facing uh, this group. This is what the Singapore Prime Minister Li Xianlong had to say. Let's watch. Countries, including major powers, are resorting to unilateral actions and bilateral deals, and even explicitly repudiating multilateral approaches and institutions. ASEAN has shown that it is still able to work together and find common ground. And this is because ASEAN is member of the conviction of ASEAN members that ASEAN is greater than the sum of its parts. So how big a challenge is that for a grouping like ASEAN, uh, which promotes multilateralism, but when you have countries that want to sign up bilateral deals? It is, of course, a very significant challenge for countries in the region, especially because they are so interdependent, economically interdependent, and the supply chains which run through ASEAN and China have final consumption markets in the United States and, and, and in the West. Uh, ASEAN has done a, has played a very critical role at these summits and broadly within the regional architecture by becoming a kind of a go-to party. Nobody can at the end of the day ignore ASEAN. All roads at the end of the day have to run through ASEAN in some way, shape or form. And that gives it some power and strength. And it is that power and strength that they leverage to maintain a broad consensus and unity in the Asia-Pacific region. I think it's a very important role. 
Another important role which we saw the Singapore Prime Minister allude to, mm. he is a very cautious man and he rarely calls out countries even indirectly. He did so at the time a couple of years back in the South China Sea Troubles were there. He did allude indirectly to China and ask it to come on board. For the first time, I am hearing from him talking indirectly to the United States that it needs to get its act right on the trade issue, and that has become a real problem for not just ASEAN, but for the entire Asia-Pacific region. All right. Let's go to Beijing, to Zhao Hai. Zhao Hai, the Chinese Premier Li Keqing, he was at the ASEAN summit. What are China's main goals uh, at the summit? Well, you've seen that uh, Premier Li Keqiang has brought uh, the continuation of China's uh, government's position that China will continue to open up and uh, cooperate with regional partners. In this particular venue, China or, uh, continue to stress the importance of keeping multilateral uh, system and uh, multilateralism uh, in not only in this region but also in the world. So I think in this uh, particular meeting, China has uh, find its friends in the region that can uh, stand with China to uphold the principle of multilateralism. Uh, however, I think it's very important at this point that China not only upgraded the uh, free trade deal with uh, Singapore and also uh, the, the upgraded uh, deal with ASEAN as a whole has taken into effect uh, from a couple of days ago. So I think overall China is taking uh, the free trade region, a free trade deal with the region to an, up to a new level and reassure the region that China will continue to open its doors and uh, making uh, the business easier for, for the regional partner. So I think in the face of uh, the United States unilateralism and bilateral tactic to negotiate with individual countries, it is important to insist in the region that we use this multilateral framework uh, to continue to cooperate with each, with, each, uh, with each other. Anthony, as we heard uh, in the introduction, very differing visions between the United States and China uh, on this particular part of the world. Uh, uh, the United States talking about empire and aggression. Uh, Vice President Pence, Mike Pence, saying there is no room for that, while the Chinese have been talking about uh, getting rid of protectionist barriers, of expanding trade, free trade. Um, what are the U.S. goals here? I mean, is, does the U.S. see this part of the world, Southeast Asia, uh, more in terms of security, its security interests, or expanding trade? Well, I think there's no doubt that the Trump administration's priority in the region is the bilateral relationship with China. That's what they think is the overriding threat to, to U.S. prosperity. That's what they think uh, all their really diplomatic and economic efforts need to be engaged towards. Uh, However, I think there is uh, uh, some signs of progress uh, from the side of the Trump administration as far as viewing ASEAN uh, for its own strengths. Uh, in the first year of the administration, we really saw an administration that knew it should engage ASEAN, but didn't necessarily seem to have an idea of why it should engage ASEAN. Uh, they, I think, uh, have now better understood ASEAN's purpose as a place uh, uh, for great powers to come together, for messages to be exchanged, and have been trying to bring initiatives that match up with ASEAN's own priorities. We saw that with uh, Secretary Pompeo's visit uh, to the ARF, where he made announcements about energy and infrastructure programs, and this time Vice President Pence uh, uh, talking about the partnership on ASEAN smart cities. Uh, they're trying to bring uh, some elements that are not just about the U.S.-China relationship, right. but also about how the U.S. and ASEAN can But Anthony, does the United States see this as some kind of zero-sum game? You know, we heard concerns expressed by the Singapore Prime Minister that the countries of ASEAN don't want to be forced into a position where they have to choose sides. Right. Yeah, that's, that's long been uh, what uh, uh, the message from ASEAN has been. Uh, however, it seems that the Trump administration does skew closer to viewing it as a real competition, as a zero-sum game. It's a distinct change between the way the Obama administration approached the region. All right, Amitendu, uh, during this ASEAN summit, and as you pointed out, the leaders also discussed the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, the RCEP. That's been in the works since 2012. Uh, they're trying to strike a deal by next year. What are the prospects? In so far as uh, the progress that has been reported in the official communiques is concerned, I think uh, it's it's uh, looking uh, to be going in the right direction. But again, as I, as I must emphasize, uh, a rather painstakingly slow progress. Uh, five chapters appear to have been finished, but there are some chapters with difficult issues, including chapters like investment, including probably uh, some bits of chapters even in the trade in goods and services, which are yet to be finalized. Now, uh, look, let me, let me put it out this way. 
I think to me, uh, it's an important signal that all 16 countries of the RCEP have finally come together to uh, put down their intention in writing that they are committed to the deal and they will finish it next year. Because even a statement, a commitment of this sort wasn't really uh, visualizable at least one to one and a half years ago. At that point in time, it appeared that RCEP is going nowhere. But today, I think a point has been reached when the collective political will of the group is not in question. I think there are individual countries which have their own domestic challenges. Some have uh, elections coming up. Some have other issues, all of these. And we know much about international trade is actually domestic. So there could be hesitations in committing to certain degrees of market access liberalization. But I think on the whole, the fact remains that the RCEP has actually come a long way. Now, if it has come that far, I'm not really too worried about the fact as to whether it might get concluded next year or whether it might take a few months more. The point is that this is well in the works. This is on its way and it is out to be shaping as the biggest free trade agreement in the world with almost half of the global population and at least, uh, you know, uh, two fifths of the world GDP. And th th that's going to be a substantive achievement that will be a very strong signal that notwithstanding the fact that the United States of America is walking out of regionals and multilaterals, there is a group of countries in the world uh, across both sides of the Pacific who are actually working hard to stitch a deal together, which is essentially inclusive in character, offering enough scope for various different economies to come together and work out trade in a manner which is mutually beneficial. So, Rob, you've written extensively about the U.S. approach to the region. Uh, the U.S. has adopted what it calls, and I saw this in one of your pieces, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, how does that compare with the Chinese approach? The free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, first of all, on the U.S.'s part, needs far greater elucidation. At this point of time, uh, one would think that would ha they would have fleshed it out, but it still just remains more in uh, more so i would say frankly on the drawing board still we have some idea of what he what uh, president trump thinks in terms of 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 trade trade agreements and how he wants to do trade liberalization on a bilateral basis etc cetera, etc cetera. but the structure of what the us is putting forth in terms of free and open indo pacific is still somewhat hazy in any case, it is very, very different from what China has in mind because China sees free and open as being, in a way, directed towards its soft containment. Uh, it, the free and open Indo-Pacific, while Mr. Trump talks a lot about trade, is essentially meant to be a geostrategic con containment or constrainment goal involving the major democracies in Asia and hopefully with buy-in from ASEAN. Uh, obviously, China is not going to be terribly amused by this, but the Chinese purpose in Asia has been to kind of broaden out economic interdependence, mm -hmm. ideally radiating out from Beijing. Now, Beijing still isn't in that position to be that, 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 that locus for regional architecture because at the end of the day, the supply chains, as we talked about, still export all their final goods or much of their final goods to Western markets till China becomes that final consumer of goods which are regionally produced, China will not have that sort of effect or impact or influence mm. on regional architecture in Asia. But that is where China is essentially leaning towards in terms of trying to create a larger economic block which is centered by and large in, in China, but does not constrain the the, the the interests of other parties in terms of who they can cooperate with at a strategic level, so long as it does not have a zero-sum coloration to it. Right. Zhao Hai, uh, China is, of course, also looking in different directions. It just held its first import expo. It wants to be a major market, uh, not just for the world, of course, but for regional partners as well. How does that fit into what we were talking about just a moment ago, the RCEP, as well as ASEAN's broader goals? Well, I was just about to mention the China Import Expo. It's very important, and uh, this message 
it's been very consistent that China is upgrading its economy uh, to a high quality development and uh, China is willing to open up more of its market for import uh, from other countries and particularly Southeast Asia countries. Uh, so I think uh, in that way China is pushing the, the uh, international free trade deals with other countries and other regions in order to establish a more comprehensive framework uh, for better quality trade and also a higher level of trade, not only in goods, but also in services. Uh, the RCEP, uh, as from the, looking from China's perspective, China is pushing very hard for RCEP. I think the unilateral actions from the, US, uh, from the U.S. actually open up a window of opportunity for other countries to reconsider the prospect of free trade and be more willing to invest in the, uh, a different trade framework. So I, I think in this respect, um, I think next year, hopefully, we can reach a deal for RCEP. And also China's pushing for China, Korea, uh, Japan free trade deal. Uh, that is also in the negotiation. In the meantime, China is also negotiating with other countries and other regions for more deals. So combine those together, uh, I think China has a hedging strategy against uh, uh, the U.S. tariff tactics against China. So overall, uh, China is trying to open up more doors, open up more markets, and at the same time, open up its own market uh, for trade. I would just uh, use one example. For instance, tourism uh, has been a very high growth industry between China and ASEAN countries, uh, and it, it will continue to grow with uh, an upgraded deal uh, with ASEAN countries. So I think in many cases, service industry is where we should look for in the future, and particularly e-commerce, uh, which has been included in China's upgraded free trade deal with Singapore and also with ASEAN countries. Anthony, looking uh, again at U.S. involvement in the region, there's something of a big question mark, uh, listening to some of the mm -hmm. comments coming out of the region, uh, over U.S. involvement, over U.S. commitment to um, Southeast Asia. There was a Singapore diplomat, Tommy Ko, who posed a question in the South China Morning Post. He said, if Asia is so important to the United States, why wasn't President Trump at the summit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, that's been a huge question uh, throughout the course of this administration. And you see it especially starkly here in Singapore, where, uh, uh, although I think Vice President Pence is very capable of representing uh, uh, the administration, uh, there's no U.S. ambassador to Singapore. There's no U.S. ambassador to ASEAN. A lot of these key posts are going unfulfilled, and that's part of the reason why uh, there just isn't the drive uh, uh, to really engage the region comprehensively. Uh, but going back to the point about uh, uh, opportunities created by the U.S.-China strife, I think it's important to keep in mind that while uh, uh, this year we saw a message from Singapore about the importance of multilateralism, next year we're going towards Thailand, and Thailand actually uh, has seen some opportunities come out of the U.S.-China trade war. Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia have all benefited from some influx of investment from manufacturers that want to look at these alternatives now that there's strife between the U.S. and China. So there, uh, these issues may be looked at from a little bit of a different way in the course of next year. So they're seeing opportunities in this? Absolutely. Uh, they're seeing threats, yeah? investment. They're yeah. seeing opportunities. They're seeing an opportunity to raise themselves up in their position and capture more of the global supply chain. Okay. Xiaohai, let's move into uh, another important issue for the summit, and that was security. There have been growing tensions between the United States and China, as we are fully aware, over the South China Sea. This is what uh, Premier Li Keqiang had to say at the summit. Let's watch this. <laughs> China is ready to work with all the ASEAN countries toward concluding code of conduct consultations in three years' time. And it is our hope that we can set up a time frame so that in three years' time, the code of conduct will contribute to peace and stability in the South China Sea. And that will also be conducted to free trade and the further upgrading of our ASEAN free trade area. So, Jean, hi. what kind of progress have we seen in stabilizing the region and easing tensions there? Well, one of the things uh, that we've been talking about is the uh, nego continuous uh, negotiation between China and ASEAN countries about the code of conduct. And I think uh, after uh, the review of uh, the, the content uh, next year, they will see, uh, the, uh, I think, the first read of the, uh, the whole text. And I think China will continue to push forward with the COC with ASEAN countries. And the problem is, while China is reducing tensions with ASEAN countries, Philippines and Vietnamese, uh, the U.S. is continuing to push for more freedom of, of uh, navigation uh, actions in the region and pushing up the tension. 
uh, with China. And uh, China is trying to uh, talk with the U.S. through uh, diplomatic and security dialogues. But at the current strategic uh, circumstances and, and the environment, uh, I, I don't think that the U.S. will reduce its activities in the region. And I think uh, the, the tension between U.S. and China will continue to be high. Uh, so in, under these circumstances, I think China uh, has a strong will to reduce the tensions between China and ASEAN countries uh, even further. Uh, particularly to, uh, through the uh, passing of uh, COC with, with those countries. I, I think other than uh, what, what's happening in South China Sea, the One Belt, One Road, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is very important for China to get closer with its neighbors in Southeast Asia and also throughout uh, th this region. Uh, I think China pursue a very different goal with the United States uh, compared to this uh, freed uh, and open uh, Indo-Pacific project. China is really invested in the region in terms of inf infrastructure and cooperation, economic cooperation and people-to-people -people exchanges. So I think when, when China has a better neighborhood policy, uh, the, uh, ov the, the South China Sea issue will be resolved uh, under this overall reduced, uh, uh, overall better relationship between China and ASEAN countries. So sort of on this uh, South China Sea issue, there was a senior officials meeting, an SOM, another acronym for us, uh, between uh, ASEAN and China in June on the Code of Conduct. What did that achieve? Oh, I think they made a lot of progress. I uh, made important progress on that. Last year they had, uh, they had uh, prepared a kind of a framework for the Code of Conduct. And in this, and at the, at the SOM, I think it was in Changsha in, in June, uh, they, they actually got down to pro having a single draft text of the code of conduct. Obviously, that's a very bracketed text, and the positions are very, fairly wide apart. But they're working now of a single document. From a negotiating perspective, this is actually pretty significant progress. And given the warmth in, in China ASEAN, developing warmth in China ASEAN relations right now, it bodes well for further important progress in the code of conduct. Whether it can be done in three years, who knows? But significant movement can be had in that period of time. But let me allude to one further point, which has gone completely unnoticed mm -hmm. at, this, at, this, at this summit. And, this, and it, I think it's a very, very important development. Yes, the talk has been about uh, free trade and the US going on its own bilateralism and, and, and those aspects. And that has captured the headlines. What has not captured the headlines is this. For the first time in perhaps 25 years, maybe even more, China has improving relationships with every major player in Asia, be it India, be it Japan, be it ASEAN, or even on the peninsula, Korean peninsula. All relationships currently simultaneously are in a warming phase. Now, let's be clear. Some of them are not terribly warm, like the relationship with Japan. But it has not been the case in the past two or three decades that all of China's neighborhood relationships in Asia are simultaneously warming. And I think this is, poses a challenge, frankly, to the US and to Donald Trump in to, in if, if, that if he really wants to have the regional right. influence that he has, that he must be able to have a positive, constructive, and a proactive agenda. Anthony, what's your view on that? I completely agree. Uh, and Look, I think it's clear that President Trump himself uh, is not going to devote his focus to developing a, a strategy for the region. So it means the administration has to get the right people in place that can be trusted, that yeah. can be listened to, to do the real work of developing this. All right, Amitendu, I've just got a couple of minutes left, and I want to address one issue which uh, Saurabh just mentioned. That is the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula. How uh, important was that for this ASEAN summit? Well, I think it was... Uh, in the background, it didn't uh, come up very specifically as a subject of uh, discussion. But nonetheless, it's continuing to remain as a matter of concern. And I think the point that, you know, in the, in the middle of the year, there were developments uh, in a particular direction, which eventually did not materialize. And now uh, matters are back to somewhat square one is also an issue. But let me, on this uh, issue and going a little broader beyond the nuclear subject, let me also try to just uh, opine this, mm -hmm. that, you know, we talked a lot about the ASEAN summit and the signals that it has sent and the relationship between China, US, ASEAN, and so forth. Let's remember one thing. Much as we talk about the ASEAN, the ASEAN is a very heterogeneous group. 
And it is not always possible for the ASEAN to frame positions. The ASEAN has been trying it very hard. It's been trying to be as pragmatic as possible to actually avoid disagreements. I think it's important to look at the matter that way, that when we talk about relationships improving vis-a-vis -a, -vis a number of countries, there are tacky areas and all of them look at relationships with major powers individually. But when it comes to certain common principles, ASEAN tries not to disagree. I think that is a point which has held the ASEAN together yeah. for a long while. And that is also the point which we see being reiterated in the summit over and over again, because it's typically stayed away from taking positions on issues where it knows ASEAN cannot punch above its weight. But at the same time, it has tried to stick and gather as close as possible around itself issues where it thinks it can make a difference to the quality of the regional architecture. Great points, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Both the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT and America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CGT and America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.